My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, we introduce public space, spaces protection orders or PSPOs through the Anti-Social Behaviour Crime and Policing Act of 2014 to enable local councils to tackle antisocial behaviour in public spaces. The Home Office does not centrally collect data on the number issued. Our statutory guidance makes clear that PSPOs should be used appropriately and proportionately. The effects of the powers are kept under review through a National Antisocial Behaviour Strategic Board. My Lords, the Minister was very constructive the last time we discussed uh, these issues and indeed helped to change the statutory guidance on PSPOs. But the fact is they are increasing at a faster rate than ever. PSPOs are continuing to target homeless people with bans on begging and rough sleeping, my Lords. Will the Government now admit that the statutory guidance has not achieved its intended aim? And isn't it now necessary, my Lords, either to properly enforce the guidance or give better means of appeal against the imposition of a PSPO or actually to change the original powers, my Lords? Well, I thank the Noble Lord um, for his kind words, and he's absolutely right, uh, following his concerns and I think the concerns of the Noble Lord, Lord Kennedy of Southwark. Uh, we did publish that updated statutory guidance um, 18 months ago to make it absolutely clear that PSPOs should not be used to target people based solely on the fact uh, that they are homeless, and they should be used, as I said, proportionately and uh, appropriately. My Lords. My Lords, will the Minister admit that the powers that PSPOs give are too great? They are too wide-ranging, as their use can extend to sweeping real concerns such as rough sleeping, as the Noble Lord Clement Jones said, under the carpet, and over 50 councils have used those powers, and to restricting personal freedoms, including the right to protest in a public space. Isn't it time PSPOs were scrapped? Well, I don't think the people who are the residents who are affected by antisocial behaviour would agree with the noble lord. Um, and I think that it's absolutely important that these, these, uh, these, these powers are kept in, in, in force because um, it, it is important that residents should be able to live their lives without uh, the effects of antisocial behaviour, uh, literally on their doorsteps in some cases. I have only been in your Lordship's house for coming up for six years, but I have lost count of the number of times that we have explained to the Home Office how their legislation as drafted could be misused, to which the Government say we do not intend the legislation to be used in that way. My Lords, trusting local authorities or the police to only use legislation in the way it was intended is no longer good enough. When will the Government incorporate measures into legislation to ensure that they cannot be misused. Well, I think the noble lord um, might be referring to um, the rough uh, sleeping uh, strategy and um, and how how the Home Office uh, uses it. Uh, my lords, I, I have to say that the Home Office isn't looking to trick. Uh, rough sleepers uh, into providing their data and using it for enforcement purposes, which has been the criticism against us. But we have been working with local authorities and charities to design an information sharing protocol that protects the rights of vulnerable individuals, but also allows for the effective operation of the RSSS. Needed, of course, it's not just trying to stop inappropriate use of PSPOs but instead for the government to change its policy and now provide cash-strapped local authorities and other agencies with the resources to bring homelessness, which isn't a crime, to an end for good through personal support, assistance into employment and more genuine low-cost housing, including social housing to rent. Reference has already been made to the fact that the Home Office had to update their guidance at the end of 2017, which now states that PSPOs, and I quote, should not be used to target people based solely on the fact that someone is homeless or rough sleeping, close quote. Why wasn't this included in the guidelines from day one? And what effective check and redress is there now, is there even now, to ensure that PSPOs are not in reality continuing to be used inappropriately against those who are homeless or rough sleeping? Because the use of the word solely, and the noble lady of the minister herself stressed that too, in the updated guidelines looks like a significant potential loophole. 
Well, I think the no noble lord will um, recognise that the, the reasons for uh, rough sleeping are many and complex, and solely based on the the fact that someone is homeless is not in and of itself a reason um, to, uh, to slap them with a PSPO order. Um, in terms of housing, um, I can say to the Noble Lord that we are investing £9 billion for more affordable homes across the country and have delivered over 400,000 affordable homes since 2010. Has, has taken many forms over the years, and in my experience, uh, dealing with it can also take several forms. One of the easiest ways to deal with it is to have sufficient police officers on the street to actually nip it in the bud as it occurs. And this always proved very valuable in, in, in my time. And that's one of the problems in the present time, because uh, we simply haven't got these frontline officers who have time to deal with it in a, in a courteous and a compassionate way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, to address the Noble Lord's point, policing is only one aspect of dealing with both rough sleeping and homelessness. Of course, they are two uh, different, different things. But in terms of um, policing, he's absolutely r right. We need, we need police on, on the streets, and hence my, my um, right honourable friend, the Home Secretary's uh, ambition to, um, to, to put far more police uh, on the street. But this year, the Rough Sleeping Initiative has allocated 46 million to 246 areas, uh, which has funded uh, an estimated additional 750 staff and over 2,600 bed spaces across England. The Minister said in answer to Lord Clement Jones that the Home Office keeps these powers under review. Can she please explain how that is being done, given that she also said, in answer to Lord Clement Jones, that no central records are kept as to when these powers are used and for what purposes? Well, in terms of uh, keeping things under review, of course the Government keeps all legislation uh, under review. And, um, and while, while uh, we don't uh, hold that data cent centrally, of course, local authorities uh, do hold um, uh, the data. And, of course, the, how effective legislation works is, 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 is played out in, in, in the effect of the legislation in question. Mr. of Parks. My Lord, I beg leave to ask a question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, nationally, access to NHS dentistry remains high, with 22 million adults and 7 million children seen by a dentist in the 22, 24 and 12 months ending in 31 December 2018, respectively. However, we know that there are areas of difficulty and more work remains to be done. NHS England, in its role as Commissioner, is responsible for commissioning NHS dental services to meet local need and is actively looking into dental access issues. Well, I think that's a rather disappointing answer, and it certainly ties in with my experience that when it was declared that it, in Manchester no children could have operations done under general anaesthetic because all slots were taken under the clearance of baby teeth. And I think I, I, on, when I saw that, I wrote to the mayor of Manchester because he had great experience on the health field when he was in. House of Commons, and uh, I didn't even get an acknowledgement. And so, after a period of time, <coughs> I again wrote saying, "Perhaps it never reached you, and so I'm really sending it to you." But I still haven't had an acknowledgement to this day. And the press reports get worse and worse about the shortage of, it, of these. Um, well, I'm very sorry to hear of my noble friend's experience uh, with the Mayor of uh, Manchester. Um, children's oral health um, is now better than it's ever been, with over 75% of five-year-olds in England decay-free, which we can welcome. However, children requiring um, tooth extraction must remain a concern. It has slightly fallen um, between 2016 and 2017-18, which we must welcome. However, we recognise that there is much more
more to do, and that is why um, the NHS Outcomes Framework um, is working in order to ensure that we perform better, um, with um, much work um, being done in order to target um, improved oral health with young people with the Starting Well Core Framework and the Starting Well um, Pilots in the 13 areas of most deprivation. In Portsmouth, there are 20,000 patients without a dentist due to the closure of three practices. In Cornwall, 22,000 people are on the waiting list and having to wait an average of 529 days before they get an NHS dentist. So the noble lady is quite right. There are some serious problems to be addressed here about access to NHS dentists. So I'd like to know exactly how those those areas which are in desperate need, like Portsmouth, are going to be tackled. And secondly, I'd like the noble lady to tell the House how many babies, children and young people are involved in those numbers who are, at this moment in time, have no dentistry care whatsoever. Well, as um, I just mentioned in my previous answer, children's oral health is better than it has ever been. This is not to say that there is any complacency or acceptance of where we are. We recognise that while access has significantly improved, there are still areas where NHS England needs to do more to meet local needs. NHS England is responsible for helping patients who cannot find a local dentist meet new patients. Those in that situation should contact NHS England's customer contact centre for assistance. Now, um, things that are being done to improve this is introducing new nationally flexible commissioning, uh, which can help national commissioners commission a wider range of services from dental practice, and also testing a new dental contract reform, which we think will make um, the profession more attractive for new dentists to come into it. Dental patients' dentist fees in England have been increasing at an unprecedented rate. These charges are discouraging patients from seeking treatment because the charges are making patients think twice before treatment. Delayed treatment means they end up seeking free help for dental pain from their GPs and the local a and &E, piling huge pressures on other parts of the NHS. So will the government take urgent action and start proper investment in NHS dentistry to end these extortionate dental increases? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the noble lady raises an important point. Uh, patient charges are an important uh, contribution to the overall costs of the NHS, and they were driven by um, some really difficult financial um, circumstances within the NHS. But she's right that it is critical that no one is deterred from seeking care by the cost. Um, and so, um, as part of this year's uplist, the government um, and the department has committed to looking further at evidence as to whether patients are being adversely impacted, so that this be can be taken into account um, in next year's and any future year's decisions. My Lord, my Lord. Care Quality Commission recently, recently published a report about dental care for people in residential, and, residential care and nursing homes. This was a pretty damning report because most of these people do not have access to a dentist. Could the noble lady say what the government is doing about ensuring that people who are in uh, residential or, or nursing home care do get regular dental treatment. The noble, um, my noble friend raises um, what is um, obviously um, a vital area and um, overall care with, for those uh, within care homes, whether it is um, health care, mental health care or dental care, um, must be uh, provided in a suitable manner. And this is being considered um, as part of the Social Care Green Paper. Well, can I declare an interest as a former chairman of the British Fluoridation Society? and ask the noble lady if she agrees with me that prevention is much better than cure and that you can prevent the need for dentists if we have a substantial increase in the use of fluoride in our water supplies. Is she satisfied with the progress that's being made on fluoridation of water? And if she's not, what plans does she have to encourage it? <laughs> Well, the noble lord is quite right that prevention is always better than cure. This is why um, the programme within um for oral health improvement within uh, the NHS long-term plan, but also within uh, the dental contract, which is being tested, both focus on a more preventative approach to oral care. When it comes to water fluoridation, it is obviously a very effective way of improving oral health, particularly for children. It must be, um, according to um, the 2012 Act, um, a local decision supported by Public Health England um, in the lead. Um, we want to see uh, more decisions. PHE's guidance on delivering better oral health sets out clear um, 
expectations on this. Uh, but there are also um, ways in which uh, we can, other ways in which fluoride can get to children. One is through um, fluoride in toothpaste, which is now at effective concentrations, and the other is that all dentists are expected to deliver fluoride to teeth directly at clinically appropriate intervals to all children in their care. My lords. To get a dentist under the health service last year. Um, I don't have those, that, that figure um, in my briefing pack, but I am very happy to write back to the noble lord um, in order to um, <laughs> confirm or deny whether that is the case. Lord West of Spithead. I beg leave to ask a question standing in my name on the order paper. My lords, the government remains committed to a surface fleet of at least 19 frigates and destroyers. The Royal Navy will have the ships it requires to fulfil their defence and policy commitments. All ships rotate through planned operating cycles involving maintenance, training, deployment, leave and capability upgrades. Obel Earl, the Minister for his uh, answer. As he well knows that there are 13 frigates, um, I was down in the, in the yard in Devonport a few days ago. Five of the Type 23s were there, and that is not unusual. One in deep refit and four coming back from operations and preparing. It means, effectively, we have eight frigates available for operations. This great maritime nation of ours, one of which is actually being used in the Gulf at the moment. Yeah. The nearest major warship to that one actually is the other side of Suez, which I find rather worrying. We are planning to order the Type 31E. I cannot see that we will be able to get the first of those ships uh, in commission, having done its first of class trials before 2024. I just cannot see it. And yet the first of the 23s pays off, this is the Argyle, aged 34, planned life of 25 years in 2023. Um, could I ask the Noble Earl, the Minister, is it possible as a matter of urgency for the MOD to look at the speeding up of the build rate of the Type 26 frigates because then we can ensure that we're getting frigates in place because we have too few as a nation. It makes us less secure, it means wars are more likely and this is really, really important to move forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my Lords, I, I take very seriously uh, the Noble Lords' uh, concerns on this issue. Um, as regards the Type 31E, as I've said on earlier occasions, we want the first uh, Type 31E ship in 2023, with five ships delivered by the end of 2028. That is to replace the five Type 23 general purpose uh, frigates. Uh, the, that, the, the Type 31E is being procured through a competition, as he knows, between UK shipyards. Now, we won't have the result of that competition until the end of this year. So until then, I don't think it's possible to make definite predictions about whether the delivery date that we have uh, charged industry with is definitely deliverable. But we hope it is. My Lords, um, since the Noble Earl has raised the question of the Type 31, may I remind them that when it was first promoted, it was described by some as being a cheap frigate. Uh, a, a description which, to use the word of the moment, appears increasingly inept. <laughs> Originally, the price was to be £250 million. Does so the government now accept that a figure of £350 million is much more realistic, that such a figure will require additional funds from an already overstretched budget and make the obtaining of the promised export orders very much more difficult to achieve? Okay. Uh, um, my Lords, no, I don't agree with that. We, we want, as I've said, we want the first ship in 2023 with five ships delivered uh, at the end of 2028, and we are still setting industry the target of an average production cost of £250 million per ship, and all the information that I have had uh, says that, that that is still realistic. My Lords, my lords. Uh, I would like to back up the noble Lord, Lord West, in his question, in the question on how effective our present uh, fleet can be. As noble lords will have seen, the frigate in action in the Persian Gulf at the moment is by the name of Montrose. And I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to uh, have contact with all the captains since it was launched. Um, the, uh, the, it's done duty looking after chasing pirates in the Gulf of Arabia Protecting in, protection in the China Seas and now in the Gulf. And I wonder, uh, I understand that the present arrangements are for quite a long spell in that situation. 
and I wonder if we currently have enough of these very effective vessels to carry out the duties that ensure our security. Um, well, as I'm sure my noble friend would expect, we keep our fleet uh, deployments under constant review in order to adapt to evolving security situations around the world. That is the case with the current situation in the Gulf. Having said that, uh, HMS Montrose's recent actions uh, demonstrate, I think, that we have the right assets in the right places. And our priority now, I should stress, is to reduce tensions in the region. Lords, <coughs> could I just build on that point? Uh, does that incident in which uh, HMS Montrose was involved indicate the probability that more frigates will have to be deployed in the Gulf? <coughs> and if so, what tasks elsewhere will be left uncovered? Um, well, my Lords, I, I, I understand the uh, reason why the Noble Lord should ask, ask that question, but it is a hypothetical question. At the moment, we, we think we have the right assets in the right places, but as I've said, we keep our deployments under, under review and our tasking under review. Noble and gallant friend, is it not the case that we now have to, uh, that we now have two admirals for every ship uh, that we have serving. Isn't it about time we did some trimming of the admirals? Uh, um, my Lords, the, the Navy has already uh, reduced the number of senior officers uh, across the piece, including its admirals. Um, we have, we believe, an appropriate number of senior officers to, um, to take charge of uh, the various responsibilities, not all of which directly relate to ships of the fleet. My Lord, sir, I am admonished that I may not ask a question which would cause a minister to answer in any way which contains secret information, but in view of the ambiguity of the noble Earl's first answer to the question from Lord West. May I please ask this? Will the future of the Royal Navy be as it is to continue to control those 13 frigates or whatever they may be, or is the government subject to some private arrangement under which it is intending to transfer the Army, the Navy and the Air Force to the control of a central European defence force as soon as we have reached the case of either a Brexit solution, a resolution, or a remain. My Lords, the, the, the Government will never give up its sovereign control of our armed forces, and I can give, I can give my noble friend that absolute assurance. Uh, if he found any ambiguity in my earlier answer, I'm sorry, but as he knows, it is not uncommon to have planned temporary small fluctuations in overall numbers when transitioning from any class of ship or, or submarine uh, to another. Bits. I would beg leave to ask the question stand in my name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, we remain concerned by heightened tensions in the Gulf of Oman. We continue to call for de-escalation on all sides and have long made clear our concerns about Iran's destabilizing regional activity. Unintended escalation would not be in any party's interest. The UK maintains a long-standing maritime presence in the Gulf. We are continuously monitoring the security situation there and are committed to maintaining freedom of navigation in accordance with international law. I'm grateful for uh, my noble friend's answer, and I'm partly reassured by that. But uh, with ongoing conflicts in Yemen and Syria, and the ground tinder dry still in Afghanistan and Iraq, Afghanistan and Iraq, would my noble friend agree that the prospect of a military confrontation with Iran has potentially catastrophic consequences? On Friday, the 21st of June, we understand that the United States was but 10 minutes away from launching multiple military strikes against Iranian targets. On the 24th of June, the Foreign Secretary warned of an accidental war uh, with Iran and the United States. Overnight, we've seen the provocation of the attempted seizure of a British tanker going through the Straits. Will my noble friend 
reassure us that every effort is being made, despite all the provocations and all the distractions, to seek a peaceful, diplomatic and political solution to this crisis. Uh, my noble friend is um, absolutely correct in his analysis that this is a situation of uncertainty and fragility, and profoundly undesirable would be any action which precipitated unintended consequences or heightened instability. And let me reassure my noble friend, we are in regular contact with the United States and other international partners, and our priority remains finding diplomatic solutions to de-escalate the tensions in the region. My Lords, isn't this a classic situation where the three Ds of diplomacy, defence and development need to work together? And what we need is our government to actually ensure that there is that collective responsibility and that they do work together. The noble Earl said that we will never give up sovereignty over our defence forces. Well, actually, we work in cooperation with our allies all the time to ensure the security of this nation. So will she tell us how we are working with our European allies to maintain the agreement with Iran so that we don't actually see that breaking up, that we actually do ensure we have enough ships to ensure that that diplomacy is secure? Will we have joined up government from uh, the new Prime Minister? <laughs> Well, I, I can speak for the current uh, government administration, uh, and can I say to the noble lord, who makes, I think, three important points. The first is, and evidence does confirm this, we do work together, we do work collaboratively, we work with our intelligence services, and as the issue of the overnight incident displayed, we are actually ready to uh, do our best to protect uh, British shipping uh, interests uh, in that area. Um, we do engage in active diplomacy, not just with global partners, but uh, directly with uh, Iran. And indeed, my right honourable friend, Dr. Murison, was uh, visiting Iran at the end of, of June. But I think, importantly, we do take the view, in conjunction with the partners under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that we the noble lord is quite right. We do need to conjoin all this endeavour. We do believe that that uh, comprehensive plan of action is the best way forward, and we want to uh, support it. But we have been consistent and clear that our commitment to that plan depends on full compliance by Iran. Now, we are urgently considering next steps under the terms of that plan in close coordination with our international partners. But let me reassure the noble lord, there is genuine, uh, not just cross departmental discussion at this end, but also with our global partners. Uh, this situation has escalated, as the noble lady has hinted, um, since the US pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. And doesn't this illustrate why we need unvarnished reports from our ambassador mm -hmm. in Washington? So what extra preparations are being made to protect major British interests in the region and British citizens if this situation escalates further? In a sense, a reprise of what I said to the noble Lord, Lord Collins. Um, we are actively engaged in the region, both uh, diplomatically. We do have um, uh, UK interests in the region. Um, as the overnight incident illustrated, we have a naval capacity which was able to come to the aid of the uh, uh, British tanker. I think that that is to be applauded, and I think we should praise the uh, crew of HMS Montreux who were able to uh, assist that situation, and uh, I think assist it in a very effective and satisfactory uh, manner. We are anxious to ensure, as my noble friend Lord Bates said, that we do everything to de-escalate tensions, and that is certainly the role of the United Kingdom government, and we are unrelenting in our efforts to uh, achieve that objective, and we do that not just with our own diplomatic endeavours, but also in conjunction with our global partners. I can't help. Right. My Lords, the government bear in mind that um, the uh, erratic and immature president in charge of the United States presides over a budget for defence which is ten times the size of Russia, and Russia's defence budget is smaller now than France. So will she heed the wise advice of Lord Bates to make sure that we keep tabs on this process to ensure that peace prevails? 
Well, th that is exactly what the United, government, uh, United Kingdom government is engaged in doing. And as I've already illustrated, there are various ways in which we, we engage upon that, um, on that um, programme. My Lord, I, I can't help wondering whether it was such a good idea to, um, for us to raid the Iranian oil tanker in Gibraltar in the first place. I mean, obviously, we want to stop oil getting to Assad, although he can get all he wants probably from the Russians. But are we not supposed to be on the same side as the Iranians over the question of nuclear proliferation and nuclear control? And can we have a firm assurance that we didn't do this just on the say-so from Washington, on, but on our own initiative? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me reassure uh, my noble friend firstly. Um, we did this at the request of the government of Gibraltar to assist with a sanctions operation. Now, the action was taken because of where the oil was going, uh, and it was going to a sanctioned Syrian entity as attested by a body of evidence. We weren't taking the action of where, because of where the oil came from. Um, so the vessel was boarded and detained in British Gibraltar territorial uh, waters, and we were, we were pleased to assist the government of Gibraltar uh, in acceding to the request it made.